We interrupt this broadcast to bring you a Fire Emblem news flash. You might remember this guy called Heimler if you've ever played Shadow Dragon. One of the most bizarre characters in Fire Emblem history, this guy has a name and portrait and yet is not a boss and is not recruitable and has no lines. No one could really figure out his significance until SerenaysForest.net's unused content page listed that in the original Fire Emblem 1, Dark Dragon and the Sword of Light on NES, the very first Fire Emblem, there was an unused character in the game's data called Heimler. Thus, fans assumed, oh hey, the mystery's solved. Heimler was unused content in the original game that was restored in the remake, right? As it turns out, this wasn't actually true. Heimler did, in fact, appear in the original Fire Emblem 1. He was not unused content at all. The administrator of SerenesForest.net simply forgot he existed. Yep, that's right, Heimler is officially the predecessor of Kellum. The only reason why no one ever corrected the site on its mistake is because, let's face it, who plays Fire Emblem 1 these days? The game has been remade twice, there's really no reason to play the original version. And because Heimler was removed from the first remake, Book 1 of Mystery of the Emblem, everyone assumed that he didn't exist in the original, when in fact he actually did. Where is this story going? Well, because Serenaire's Forest is the biggest source of Fire Emblem information, it's listed on just about every Fire Emblem trivia page ever that Heimler in Shadow Dragon is a character who was unused in the original game, but restored in the remake. This is wrong. If you see this listed as trivia on any wiki or any kind of Fire Emblem resource ever, please correct it. And that's why I've added this thing to my video, just to get the word out. So with that, I return you to your regularly scheduled programming. <laughs> Welcome back to the Fire Emblem Awakening playthrough. Last time, Mary Sue took over the world. But before we go and stop her, I promised that I would show the other ending. So here we are at Grima, just to show this. Why am I here and not at the end? Well, I thought that just for completeness sake... <laughs> By the way, this is on my other file, and you'll see why I'm using my other file later. So the reason why I am here is because I thought, you know, for completeness sake, I may as well show what happens if you say yes to submit to Grima. Right. Wait! And you get sucked in immediately. Yeah. So, this uh, pretty much states directly what is heavily implied. Grima here is nowhere near at full power. They need to uh, basically fuse with the Avatar in order to do that. And so, in this option, the Avatar is kind of stupid. So, yeah, that's why I like choosing no, because it's more genre savvy. What? <laughs> no. And here's where the two options meet up again. So, you still dare resist me is the point where from here on it's always the same. But I do have a couple of things to show in the Power of Friendship sequence. So, just a proof of concept, Longku does not hesitate when you have a male avatar. And here is what female Morgan says, because they're the one character who I didn't get a chance to show before, because they don't exist if you have a female avatar. So with this, that's every character's final chapter quote shown. So, something that I need to point out here. 
You cannot skip Grima's battle animations at all. Even if you skip the entire enemy turn, it will always show Grima's attack. And so as you can see, I am mashing the start button here, and nothing's happening. Also, if I skip here... It's basically going to skip the whole enemy turn, except if... And that's not going to be the case here since... Um, Anyway, we're, we've basically cut straight through to Grima, and the uh, reason I have everyone else here is because Staff uses Sport eventually, and they heal Grima, which is really, 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 really annoying. So a few other things that I need to point out about Grima that I didn't mention the first time I did this chapter. I can't believe I forgot to mention this, because this is one of the major things about Grima. On Lunatic Mode, Grima has a, a new exclusive skill that only he and the final DLC Ultimate Super Boss ever get, and that is Rightful God. This skill is basically a better version of Rightful King. It adds 30% to skill activation rates, which basically means that Lunatic Grima will pretty much always activate Ignis. Not only that, but Lunatic Mode Grima has all of their stats maxed out. Which, uh, yeah, is kind of insane. Also, he's standing on an Ire a tile. This is the only one of its kind in the game, which gives 3 defense and 20 evasion. Of course, they don't really mean all that much considering that his stats are already very high to begin with. Okay then, let's see if we can get some other characters to help out here. Also, I don't think I ever showed this quote from Grima in the regular run. This is just his, his generic quote for just any random person in the army. Uh-oh. For some reason, I think that Grima's Ignis can't miss or something, because most activation skills generally do have a chance of missing, but I have never seen Grima miss with Ignis before, so... I guess he just can't miss with it. Now, yeah, weirdly enough, legendary weapons are just not doing that much to Grima with Dragon Skin, and, um... Yeah, so I'm gonna go for Selica's Gale here, because Brave Weapons are pretty broken. That, and I have equipped Palm with a Brave Weapon there as well. Alright, yeah, you're getting your scales tipped, Grima. And again, he has a 52% chance of hitting here, but I have never seen him miss Ignis before. Here's how it's done. Face me. Checkmate. And checkmate, Grima! That was pretty satisfying, actually. Kind of shows that brave weapons are broken, but um, that did actually show just um, how tough Grima is to take down if you don't use Falchon. So uh, if you want to do this chapter the easy way, definitely use those. But if not, Grima can actually put up quite a bit of a fight. I am actually kind of surprised that I was able to take him down that quickly. So at least I let him show off um, his true power a little bit more. Of course, this is the real thing that I wanted to show off um, in this playthrough. What happens if you say yes to letting Chrome land the final blow? So, let's say yes and enjoy the other ending. Though, something that I uh, actually think is interesting, that the choice actually defaults to no, which in a way shows the kind of person that the Avatar really is. But anyway, let's say yes here. And no dramatic lines at all, just, uh, whack, basically. And with that, Grima falls, but this time, he's only been sealed once again, rather than destroyed outright, although I... It's weird they used the same animation there, as if Grima died permanently. Should have at least been a bit different. Speaking of different though, here's where the real difference in the ending is going to come. It looks like Grima's just turned to stone here rather than actually died.
So Krom is happy that he, he got to do this without sacrificing another life. Of course, we are sacrificing, in a way, our descendants a thousand years in the future for this, so it uh, does feel a bit uncharacteristic for Krom to be this happy here. And this line right here, which you don't see in the other ending. I have something to say about this line. The song that's playing now is named after this line. Grima has returned to slumber. Why is that really stupid? Well, this song's played before. This song played after we defeated Gangrel and after we defeated Wild Hearts. And yet, the song that plays there is called Grima has returned to slumber. Which is, again, really stupid, because people could think, Oh, hey, this song's really cool, I'll just look up the official soundtrack, and whoa, spoilers! Yeah, giving the song such a spoilery title, because in the Japanese version, this song did not have such a spoilerific name, and it in fact had a much more generic name that could have fit all of the situations. I think in the Japanese version, it was just called something like, Now It's Finally Over. As in, it was named after one of Krom's lines from earlier in this ending, rather than Naga's. <laughs> also, I find it kind of weird that, um... That Naga did not appear at all in the other ending. So, that's one thing this ending has over that one. So, yeah, one will rise up to challenge him, but that's kind of somebody else's problem. Now, this is one thing about this ending that I like better than the other ending. You actually get a bit more closure for this game's story and characters. Even though the other ending is better for the world as a whole, this ending feels more satisfying to me for... you'll see. Well, unless you want to go back and do more grinding skirmishes. See metaphors. And just like the other ending, every character gets aligned, but in this case, they're a lot more happy. <sighs> <laughs> That's awesome. <Remarkable. laughs> and Virion's awesome as always. Class dismissed. <laughs> and callback here. See, yeah, another thing I like about this ending, you get more callbacks with these characters that we've, um, had the company of through this whole journey. Well, that was intense. Well, I feel edified. <laughs> oh. That was amazing! <sighs> yes! I still like Rickan in terms of gameplay, so I'd say yes. <laughs> I oh, see. That's a great line too. <laughs> sweet, sweet victory. Yeah, more puns. Oh yes. <laughs> that felt good. Though the case with Noe here is that she'll still be alive by the time Grima comes back. So this is a bit bittersweet for her. In Naga's name. And that's a nice line too. And that's a good line too, see? There's a lot of good lines in this ending. There. Oh my. Wow. Except for this line. Suffice to say, Henry did not say anything like this in the Japanese version. In fact, I was almost forgetting that I have to endure another one of Henry's lines here. I'm sorry, just Henry's English localization, I hate it more than I've hated anything in a very long time. In the Japanese version, Henry here just said something along the lines of, it looked like we were going to be destroyed there for a moment, but hey, we actually turned out okay. Nyaha! But in this version, he's still playing up his self-harm fetish, which I just think is absolutely horrible, and whatever localization did this should be ashamed of themselves. Our bonds are strong. That's actually a good line from Lucina here. And mentioning Yenfei again. <laughs> and most likely, um, Walhard and um, Gregor will join you there. Very nice. A 
And I still don't like that Donald gets put all the way at the end with the other parallel characters. Another happy customer. <laughs> I don't think Creep is exactly a happy customer to be sealed for another thousand years. Down, sword hand. And Wayne is amazing as usual. <sighs> oh yeah, and Inigo here has white hair because um, some of the characters may have different hair colours because I did a few different pairings in this file. Again, Henry's his father in this one. And as you can see, uh, Cynthia's Crom's daughter in this file. <laughs> oh, Severo didn't go Sundera in that one. <laughs> and yeah, a different line here from... Um, I'm pretty sure Male Morgans is almost exactly the same. Just repl f For most of the normal quotes for uh, Male and Female Morgan, you just replace father with mother and it's basically the same. You're a lifesaver! And yes, Yarn is my avatar's child in this playthrough, as you can tell by that green tuft of hair. Excellent data. And Lawrence's father here is Frederick. <laughs> Whoa. There. Really? That's it? And yeah, this one has more hints of what will eventually happen in Gangrel's ending. And yeah, yeah, we get it, Wildheart. You don't like gods. <laughs> Interesting that they they both mentioned each other in these quotes. That was good for me. Not bad. <laughs> and again, there's a bit more closure for the characters in this ending with lines like this. And now we get to the main part of the ending's difference. Hey. So, in this one, the Avatar feels guilty that they weren't able to make the sacrifice to kill Grima for good. Oh. But you do get a bit of reassurance as to, well, the main reason why you would want to choose this ending. <laughs> and this is the reason why I did this ending on this file. You get an extra line of dialogue from whoever your avatar married. Unless your avatar married Krom, in which case you get no additional lines here. That's why I didn't show this ending on the other file, basically. So every character in the game has an additional line, uh, set of lines here for if they're married to the avatar. The only one who doesn't get any is Krom. Hey, come on avatar, you should say more than that. Have you reverted to the silent protagonist option, even though that's not supposed to exist anymore? And also the Avatar's children reassure them too. You do get these if the Avatar married Krom, but yeah, I didn't want to show that version because you miss out on the spouse scene. Of course, Morgan always says the same thing regardless of who her mother slash father was. But here, every character who, um is a non-fixed child of the Avatar gets alternative lines here too, which means only Lucina in the case of female Avatar, annoyingly. Why have you reverted to Silent Protagonist? Seriously. And then you also get this shot, which you don't get in the other ending. With us. Reminds me a lot of the final um, scene of um, Mystery of the Emblem and... Um, well, not Mystery of the Emblem, the remake of Mystery of the Emblem, where you see Marth um, with the Avatar.
And with that, we go to the ending again. So, brief thoughts on that ending. When I first uh, found out about uh, the ending of this game, because I did get spoiled on the ending choices way ahead of time. In fact, this is my first time uh, ever really beating the game for most of my files, because I just overgrinded too much and I got bored of the game my other one. Anyway though, when I first read about the endings, I thought, oh come on, there's no reason not to choose the Sacrifice Yourself ending. Because that way, Grim is gone, you spare future generations um, that kind of horror, and the Avatar survives. There's no downside, right? Actually, there kind of is. The actual ending itself, I feel, is overall less satisfying if you choose to uh, sacrifice yourself. It's a better fate overall for the world, but in terms of an actual ending, the normal, well not normal, the, the have Krom deal the final blow ending actually gives more closure to this game's plot and its characters. You end with all of the characters saying what they're going to do after the war and celebrating their victory, you also get more closure for the Avatar's family, something that the other ending severely lacked. Now, I really, really wish that maybe in the other ending, the Avatar's spouse and children got lines when they were reunited with the Avatar after the final cutscene, after the, e the, the, the end screen. That would have made things so much better. But, uh, actually, also here, you can actually see my, um, my heroes for my first playthrough. As you can see, I switched Pan to a thief at some point. But, uh, anyway, I might actually show all of these just so you can compare them to the other playthrough. But yeah, it's just this ending I felt overall, despite the fact that it's it's definitely really not exactly a totally happy ending because Grima is still going to return in a thousand years. It's just that the fact that the other ending ends with all the characters just saying how much they miss the Avatar and how sad they are they sacrifice themselves, it just feels overall less satisfying than this one. It's kind of interesting as well, it's just... This ending's a lot better than I thought it would be. Originally I thought, oh, this is clearly the worst ending. There's no reason to choose this one, but I actually quite like it. However, there is in a way another ending to this game that I like even better than both of these, and that's the one that I'm going to be going for in the next few videos. Now, speaking of which, I'll also cover something else with this game's ending. For some reason, for some very bizarre reason that I have no idea why, this ending of Awakening is controversial because Awakening ends on an unambiguously happy ending and apparently a whole lot of fans don't like that, go, oh, it's too cliche, it's not bittersweet enough, it's too happy. Okay, just think for a moment. Most Fire Emblem games pretty much end this way. Most Fire Emblem games have unambiguously happy endings. It's kind of how things work in, um, well, Nar got Hero of the Paralogue that she was actually part of. That's kind of cool. Anyway, most Fire Emblem games have unambiguously happy endings. The only real bittersweet thing is the fact that some sympathetic enemies may have died along the way, or some major NPCs may have died. So, for example, this ending still fits. We won peace, the war is over, but Mustafar's dead, the original Yenfei is dead, Emerin has basically lost all semblance of the person she used to be. There were still losses along the way, and that's basically how most Fire Emblem games work with their endings. Really, the darkest ending of a Fire Emblem game to me was Blazing Sword. And that's another weird one, because again, English fans were spoiled on that one, because it's a highly unconventional Fire Emblem. And the only reason it has a, a sort of a kind of sad ending is because it's a prequel. And of course, prequels have to end badly to set up the conflict of the game that comes after. The other game I'd say that has a relatively dark ending by Fire Emblem standards is Sacred Stones. But even then, the Demon King is gone forever, so it still ends mostly happily. The only sad thing there is that there was an earthquake in, in Grado, and that, uh, at least if you were playing on Ephraim's story, Lion was pretty sympathetic. And now I just want to show a few character epilogues that I didn't get a chance to show last time. 
Firstly, we actually get an ending for Krom this time. This is part of why I don't like the Krom and Avatar pairing, because it reduces Krom, the main character, to just a footnote in the Avatar's ending. So yeah, with anyone else, Krom gets his own ending. It's pretty brief, but yeah, every queen has a different line, except for the Village Maiden, which just gives you Krom's solo ending. Yeah, she's that unimportant. I'll just skip ahead to the next epilogue that I want to show. Oh, well, I kinda guess I can show Gaius' solo ending, seeing as he was one of the Forever Alone characters in this file. That mostly happened just because I would have paired him with Pan if I wasn't pairing my avatar with her, and the fact that I basically used her as my main thief. And next should be Gregor. Yeah, here we go, we can see Gregor's solo ending, which is actually kind of sad because uh, he doesn't have anyone to pull him out of his life of excess. So Gregor's another character who I think that for story purposes you really should pair with someone. And is the next one the next one I want to show? No, it's uh, actually Libra's solo ending. I guess I could show that one. So three forever lone characters in a row. So the first paragraph is the same, but they also mention that they think he's an incarnation of Naga, possibly a reference to the fact that Naga was kind of gender ambiguous before this game. Now is he? Yes he is! Okay, yeah. So I really couldn't end things off on the note that Henry's solo ending gave, so let's just show his paired ending. So as much as I hate Henry's localization, I really, really like his paired endings, especially the one with Olivia, as you can see there. Um... Inigo actually does take after Henry quite a lot in the way that he smiles all the time. Wait a minute, I actually forgot to pair Lucina with Jerob in this playthrough, so I can actually show her solo ending, which I really, really like. I... yeah, I actually think this ending is really good. Oh, and I guess I can show uh, Wayne's paired ending with female Morgan, even though it isn't very much different with, with his, um paired ending with anyone else. Though, they always mention that Morgan's memory never returned in all of their paired endings, regardless whether they're male Morgan or female Morgan. And here's the other one that I wanted to show, uh, Inigo's paired ending, because I didn't get a chance to show that last time because he was forever alone. Now I think about it, I really should have shown Frederick's paired ending, dang it. Anyway, we also get to see a bit more of Cynthia here. And well, I guess I can show Shell's solo ending. Well, that heartbreak thing's kind of sad. Interesting. And, I guess, Severa's unpaired ending. Oh yeah, this one's actually kind of interesting. So she does go out on a journey, hint hint, but because she's Sundere, she visits her family once a year. <laughs> it's not like she likes them or anything. And, I guess, Jerome's solo ending as well. This one's actually very different to his paired endings. <laughs> well, that basically sums him up. And here's the main one I wanted to show. Yarn and Nar's paired ending. See, Nar cares for him. She stares, stares him out of trouble. And then this is interesting. This thing about finding out Yilis was the best place after all is not in any of Yarn's other paired endings, which is interesting. And yeah, I didn't actually do all that many second generation pairings in this file, so I've got a lot of solo endings there. So many of them go on expeditions around the world. <laughs> and he wrote a novel. I maybe that maybe that's the book we're seeing on the bottom screen now. Maybe Laurent was the writer of this. 
And so now we basically just get the regular VN screen. I didn't bother to show the Avatar's paired ending because it's always the same, regardless of... It just has the name of their spouse inserted into the end part. So if you've seen one Avatar paired ending, you've seen them all. So I felt no need to show off uh, the one for this playthrough. But the difference here is that when you press A on the end screen... It just saves and takes us back to the main menu after giving us this note that I didn't talk about last time. So, basically there's no real New Game Plus in this game, but there is one element that does carry over to new playthroughs. Whenever you start a new game, the highest renown across all your save files gets carried over. Which can help out new files quite a lot, so that is one thing that kind of gets not so much shared between playthroughs, but it kind of gradually accumulates between playthroughs, basically. Also, after beating the game... Uh, see, now, when I first beat the game with my other file, I got a message saying that the song Champion was unlocked for skirmishes. I'm not sure if you just need to beat the game to unlock that, or whether you need to beat the game after recruiting Priam to unlock that song. I'm guessing you need to recruit Priam and then beat the game. But, uh, and that's what unlocks Champion. While I'm at it though, I might as well just briefly show off the game completion extras here, because I don't want to make them their own video. So, after you beat the game, a few more options get added to the extras menu. The first is Theatre, which lets you re-watch the movie cutscenes of this game, of which there aren't very many. You have to press L and R to switch over. Interestingly though, the final cutscene for the Sacrifice the Avatar ending is not actually here, which is a kind of a way of um, not spoiling it for people who haven't seen that ending yet. Then there's the support log. I already showed this with uh, Gangrel uh, at one point, but the support log basically contains every support that you have accumulated across all of your playthroughs. Um, I believe you don't actually have to beat the game in order to act unlock the supports, you just need to see the supports and then save. Hence why I believe, yes, I have Mary Sue's C, B and A with Kellum unlocked here, which I did on a completely separate file and not my main playthrough file. I don't have the S unlock because I didn't save after I did that, so you don't actually have to beat a file in order to get these supports. Now, actually maxing out the support log is, well, ridiculous, because look at this, okay? So the Avatar not only can support every single character, but they also have non-parent and child and parent and child supports for all the second gen characters. Not only that, but every single second generation character has a father support for every possible first generation male. And in some cases, sibling supports with Morgan, or a um, parent child support with a with Morgan if the Avatar married the second generation character. So yeah, good luck maxing out the support log, you're gonna need it. I've heard the best way to do it is to get a spare file and basically get every female up to an A with every male, then unlock the S's but don't actually initiate them, and then just slowly just do every single S support with just reloading the game afterwards. Usually the best way to get those S supports, but uh, yeah, good luck unlocking all the parent-child supports. It's not really worth it either, because a lot of them are the same. Um, for example... I checked this off camera, and Frederick's father-child support with Cynthia is exactly the same as Crom's father-child support with Cynthia. Just like Lucina's uh, mother-child support with a female avatar is exactly the same as her mother-child support with Sumia. So really, some of the supports are identical anyway. Then there's the unit gallery. The unit gallery is kind of interesting. It lets you view characters in their default base classes, and lets you press the X button to make them do animation. And you can also wiggle the camera around. You can also change the backdrop here, so... Woods, Fort, Hills, Water... Every single background in the entire game is here, so even Dragon's Table, Table Approach, The Ruins of Time... 
and I never realized that Fort Steiger actually got its own map for both exterior and interior, which is kind of cool. So yeah, you'll see um, a lot of chapters had their own unique backgrounds, which is interesting. I still love the Mila tree. Also, you might have been wondering about the lack of a sound test option unlocked after beating the game. That's because the unit viewer is also the game sound test. So, here's the spoilerific title again. So here you can listen to any piece of music in the game. At least most of them. There are a few songs that aren't actually here. Mainly the DLC songs, because, well, they weren't even in the base game. But also the credits theme. The credits theme is missing from here entirely for some odd reason. But anyway, that is basically everything you unlock for beating the game. You know what, I might as well show this too. The Hubba Tester is a very, very silly thing that you can do, that it says here for amusement purposes only. You pick two characters, and the game will tell you what their relationship is like. Let's see what the fortune teller has to say about Crom and Mary Sue. <laughs> oh yeah, okay, that... <laughs> that is perfect, that's perfect considering what I just did in the other ending. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah, okay, that was really too fitting. Anyway, this is completely random. It doesn't matter if the characters are married in the file, not married, same gender, opposite gender, related, a parent and child. You do get different quotes from Old Hubba based on the pair you choose though. For example, if I picked a parent and child, where is Lucina? It's a problem with having so many characters. Come on, Lucina's got to be here somewhere, right? No, well, might as well do Morgan. So if you pick a parent and child, Old Hubba gives different lines. <laughs> Interesting. So yeah, thankfully these ones are, not, are never considered romantic. Also, siblings give, give different lines, so if I can do Crom and Lissa... <laughs> expects betrayal. Um... That's a bit of an unfortunate thing for you to say, Old Hubba, because I think both their parents are dead. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, let's, um... Hmm. Also, you can actually do this with Spot Pass characters as well. So, crack pairing time! Hahaha. <laughs> Well, I mean, they both are assassins, and Katarina is essentially Nino, so this... Maybe this isn't as much of a crack pairing as I thought. You know, I just want to... I want to... I'm wondering about something. Do Sairi and Yenfei count as siblings for the purpose of this? I really hope they do. Hmm. I wonder if they actually don't. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, um... You know what? Just for hilarity's sake, and to show off this is an option. Uh... What do Marth and Roy think of each other, according to Old Hubba? Disclaimer, Old Hubba is not a reliable source of information at all. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's that option. It's very, very weird and has no practical purpose at all, but is good for laughs. And with that, we're done with this video. Next time... Actually, I'll leave next time as a surprise. Find out what we're doing next time when the video is released.